Um, welcome, everyone. Um, can I ask everyone to come in and take a seat? Um, we're just about ready to get started with the session. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, and welcome to this plenary session where we have a, a two very interesting talks uh, lined up for you today. Um, I'd like to uh, first uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Patricia Didis. Um, honored to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Didis is a lead behavioral scientist in the Division of STD Prevention um, at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. A social psychologist, uh, Dr. Didis has spent many years focusing her research on parental influences on adolescent uh, sexual risk behavior. And now she's doing a lot of interesting work on adolescent uh, access to sexual health care. So today, uh, Dr. Didis is going to be focusing on social and behavioral research in the era of biomedical advances in STI and HIV treatment and prevention. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Patricia Didis for this uh, plenary discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. I'd like to thank the Scientific Committee for inviting me to speak here today. It really is quite an honor. I hope that I can do this slide thing. Oh, yeah. OK, here's an overview of what I'll be covering today in my talk. First, I'll do a brief review of social and behavioral research related to STI and HIV prevention, and then an even briefer overview of biomedical advances in STI and HIV treatment and prevention. Then I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on describing a new focus for social and behavioral research. So there's not going to be a lot of time to cover everything that's relevant here, so I've chosen a couple of things at the individual level to highlight, so adherence, disinhibition, and self-regulation, and then at the population level, coverage and targeting, disparities, and social determinants of health. So for the past 20 years or so, the majority of social and behavioral research was focused on individuals, particularly on the identification of individual level risk factors for STI and HIV. So here are just a few examples. Multiple sex partners, monogamy and concurrency, drug use including needle sharing, condomless sex, and sex work. Temporal trends and trends in determinants of those risk factors were also explored as was population composition, so discovering who is most at risk, racial ethnic minorities, adolescents, and men who have sex with men. There's, needless to say, a very large literature on this topic. Additionally, many years were spent on developing and evaluating behavioral interventions focused on individual risk behavior change as a means of preventing STD and HIV. Many of these um, Interventions had an emphasis on skill building and role plays, for example, around negotiation or consent. They included condom demonstrations and acquisitions with the goal of increasing condom use. They included peer-to-peer -peer support and risk reduction strategies. Successful interventions tended to be those that were intensive, multi-session workshops held with small groups of individuals. However, behavior change was often short-lived, sometimes for as little as a couple of months. There was greater success with adolescent rather than adult populations, as it's easier to change behaviors that are not entrenched or even have not yet begun. But outcomes were often limited to behavioral rather than disease outcomes. So you might see an impact on condom use, but not on STI. And there was a limit to how much impact individual level interventions could achieve. So population level change often couldn't be expected because the interventions just didn't have enough reach. Now, on the flip side, in the past decade, there's been an explosion of research on a variety of biomedical advances in STI and HIV treatment and prevention. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but includes antiretroviral therapy for HIV-infected individuals, pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV-uninfected individuals, including women, research on the protective role of a healthy vaginal microbiome in the prevention of STI and HIV, the use of multipurpose technologies and male circumcision and HPV vaccine. 
The opportunities are many and population level impact on disease outcomes is now possible and has already begun for some populations. So with an increased focus on biomedical approaches and with a decreased focus on individual behavioral approaches, it's time for a new focus for social and behavioral research. So what we're seeing now is rather than abandoning social and behavioral research, we have a shift in the relevant social and behavioral factors for research. So important questions include what behaviors are necessary for biomedical interventions to succeed? How do we further leverage those innovations? And how can we incorporate the context in which behavior occurs? So beginning with individual level factors and adherence, <laughs> sorry. Although we now have efficacious biomedical interventions, these will impact infection levels in the population only if they're implemented at the right scale. Intervention efficacy, of course, only matters if interventions are used at the right dose, at the right time, consistently, or at all. This is adherence. Many factors affect adherence. For a product, things like its taste, size, side effects, safety concerns, and cultural acceptability all contribute to adherence. As well, the timing and frequency of recommended use, the need for volition, memory, the stigma associated with a condition or product, as well as community sanctions for the product. In the VOICE trial, we learned that daily use of products was not acceptable for young unmarried women as compared to married women over the age of 25 for a variety of reasons, including the women being afraid of being seen with HIV drugs or assumed to have HIV. These young women had 40% lower adherence than the older women, although HIV incidence was much higher in this group. In addition to self-reported adherence, researchers tested blood samples for presence of drugs and discovered that most blood samples that should have had drugs in them did not, despite almost 90% of women reporting that they had used their assigned study products. These results were found despite good st study quality, so most women attended their study visits, most women completed study procedures, and most women stayed in the trial, so there was good retention. Adherence measurement is constrained by limitations of both self-report and biological markers. Self-reported adherence data are prone to error, both intentional and unintentional misreporting of use, as well as staff errors in data collection. Biological markers are also prone to error. They are often a one point in time measurement. There are constraints on random unannounced specimen collection. There tends to be more adherent product use prior to scheduled visits. And there's also difficulty in measuring drugs that are not systemically absorbed. However, measurement is important. Measurement itself may increase adherence, and composite measures help. So for example, in the Caprice of 4 gel trial, adherence was assessed by several things, self-reported sexual activity, used applicator counts, and cervical vaginal fluid drug, drug levels. There was a significant association between adherence and product effectiveness. Context plays a role in determining adherence as well. Context to consider includes a trial versus a prevention program, known versus unknown risk, known versus unknown product efficacy, as well as sociocultural acceptability. So for example, interventions to increase drug, uh, adherence, such as conditional cash transfers or drug level measurement, may have different levels of effectiveness in different contexts. So for example, $5 might have a great effect in Tanzania, but not in the United States. Next, I'd like to talk a bit about PrEP adherence specifically. Numerous clinical trials have evaluated the efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV infection. Efficacy of PrEP has varied and was largely dependent on adherence. So the table shown here is from a meta-analysis of PrEP trials, including women. There were substantial differences in the risk of HIV by level of adherence, with the greatest protection being found when adherence to PrEP was greatest at 75%. Several factors influenced adherence, for example, partner violence. 
But PrEP adherence is a complex issue. So there's a role of risk perception, the issue of what constitutes an adequate dose, as well as other prevention methods that are being used. Haberer et al. have proposed a prevention effective adherence paradigm for PrEP and have compared this paradigm with the one for ART and for clinical trials for PrEP. So when looking at adherence in terms of antiretroviral therapy of HIV infection, it's a simple message. Success is achieved through 100% adherence, that is, by always and forever taking medication. And although work has been done in terms of what constitutes adequate adherence required for viral suppression, generally speaking, lifelong sustained adherence is the protocol for ART. This has also been the case for PrEP clinical trials in order to determine its efficacy in preventing infection. But now that we've got enough evidence for PrEP, the situation changes. We can think of success being achieved when PrEP is used during all episodes of HIV exposure. And because an individual's risk of HIV acquisition changes over time, and alternative prevention strategies might be used, the indication for PrEP also changes over time. So if someone is consistently using condoms or is in a monogamous relationship with an HIV uninfected partner, they may perceive lower risk and discontinue PrEP. All of this nuance around risk makes measurement difficult, so we can't count on drug levels in blood, and so we'll need to incorporate counseling around risk perception. Counseling can be used in a number of ways, first to assess risk behaviors and perceived risk, but also to present a menu of prevention options with choices varying as risk of exposure varies. However, when perceived risk of exposure is ongoing for weeks or months, PrEP would still be recommended. Counseling can also be used to assess adherence and keep track of any breaks in taking PrEP, as well as to assess the need for additional supports. Black and Latino, young men who have sex with men, and transgender women of color face structural barriers that contribute to HIV vulnerability and that impact medication adherence and retention in PrEP care. An intervention focused on providing adherence support and retention to care was evaluated at Howard Brown Health in Chicago. High rates of visit completion and retention are critical to adherence. So for example, missed visits might mean missed opportunities to refill products. They found higher retention rates for black and Latino, young MSM and transgender women of color with case management than without. 82% retention at first follow-up and 47% at second follow-up as compared to 36% and 26% without case management, suggesting this is a promising approach. Then moving on to disinhibition and self-regulation. So what do we mean by disinhibition? Disinhibition is a lack of restraint manifested as disregard for social conventions, impulsivity, and poor risk management. It affects motor, cognitive, emotional, instinctual, and perceptual aspects of behavior. It's a process which results in an individual having reduced capacity to manage their immediate impulsive response to a situation. Intoxication, social power, and anonymity have all been found to increase disinhibition. Similarly, self-regulation or willpower is the ability to monitor and control our own behavior, emotions, or thoughts, altering them in accordance with the demands of a situation. Self-regulation takes energy, and the amount of this energy is limited. So if you resist some desires and temptations, you're more likely to give in to others. And self-regulation uses up glucose, as do decision-making, taking initiative, and the immune system. But practice helps. The more you practice self-regulation, the better you get at it. And people with high levels of self-regulation perform better, have better relationships, are healthier, and they live longer. Disinhibition is a challenge in STI and HIV prevention. Sexual and preventive behaviors are complex systems. Behaviors influence each other. So for example, using condoms is correlated with higher risk partners and higher numbers of partners. So then what is the relationship between taking PrEP and practices that lead to higher risk for STI? A secondary analysis from the Summit trial highlights how risk behaviors sometimes cluster. The study measured medication adherence among HIV-positive MSM, 
beliefs about HIV transmission risk and sexual risk behavior in the form of both concordant and discordant unprotected anal intercourse. They found that missing at least one dose in the past month was associated with concordant and discordant anal intercourse with non-mean partners. So those who were unable to adhere to their medication regimen were also more likely to engage in risk behavior. Additionally, the belief that a low viral load lowers transmission risk was positively associated with discordant sex with non-mean partners only among those who missed their dose intentionally. Here are the results of the modeling study presented earlier this year at CROI that have since been published. The figure on the left shows STI incidence by PrEP STI screening interval, with the least decline at 12-month intervals, the yellow line, and greatest at one-month and three-month intervals, the purple and dark blue line. As well, the figure on the right shows STI incidence by proportion treated, with, of course, the lowest incidence with 100% treatment, the yellow line. The study found that if 40% of PrEP-eligible MSM initiated PrEP and underwent biannual screening, more than 40% of chlamydia infections and 42% of gonorrhea infections would be prevented over the next 10 years, even if a patient reduced condom use by 40% while on PrEP. The decline was attributed to an increase in detection of asymptomatic and rectal cases, which would be subsequently treated. Conversely, however, at lower levels of PrEP uptake and relatively high behavioral risk compensation, that is lower condom use, the model predicts that behavioral STIs can go up. On to population level factors, first coverage and targeting. Coverage must be prioritized across subpopulations based on diversity and clustering of infections and risk. Coverage must be expanded rapidly and without delay, and it must be sustained. Those most likely to transmit infection must be prioritized first. There are three factors related to expanding coverage over time, timeliness, duration, and rapidity. Interventions may be effective during some phases of epidemics and not others. Issues faced by scale-up efforts change with duration of such effort, and rapidity of scale-up must exceed the rate at which infection spreads. We are aiming for a favorable prevalence dynamic. That is, the rate at which potential, in, in, uh, potential infections are averted is greater than the rate at which new transmissions occur, and the rate at which infectious individuals are removed from the pool is greater than the rate at which newly infected individuals are added to the pool. But we must expand coverage in the context of limited resources, declining resources, and larger, larger cultural and political concerns. However, expanding coverage is complicated. First, epidemic evolution is nonlinear. Second, intervention effectiveness is often also nonlinear. So as investment increases, increases, the number reached increases, but those remaining are harder to reach and might be less likely to respond to intervention. And third, interventions in combination may avert fewer infections than single interventions implemented alone. The same infection cannot be averted twice. This hierarchy of intervention subpopulation targets shows us that uninfected persons with low risk behaviors should be our lowest priority targets, whereas infected persons with high risk behaviors should be our highest priority targets. Prioritization of subpopulations, irrespective of approach, helps to increase intervention impact, increase cost effectiveness, and decrease cost. Prioritization is more effective in concentrated epidemics and when coverage is low. We know that risky behaviors cluster, so just 20% of women accounted for 60% of vaginal sex acts in the past week, and 20% of women account for 47% of opposite sex partners in the past year. Likewise, just 15% of villages in India contain 54% of all female sex workers. Similarly, infections cluster, such that 20% of the population cover 39% of chlamydia, 52% of gonorrhea, and 64% of primary and secondary syphilis. Therefore, interventions should target high-risk populations by geography, by demography, and so on. Moving on to disparities and social determinants of health. I'd like to focus on the relevance of social determinants of health 
which can be defined as the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. Social determinants are associated with disparities in many health outcomes, and they affect many of the same populations that are hardest hit by STIs and HIV. The factors associated with disparities are also associated with STI and HIV risk, for example, education, income, housing, behavioral health, stigma, and social discrimination. STI acquisition rates and therefore disparities can be driven by social determinants of health. For example, take the 22% increase in HIV diagnoses reported among black MSM in the United States between 2005 and 2014, and the 24% increase among Hispanic and Latino MSM. Although overall and among women, we've seen steady declines in HIV diagnoses, major racial disparities remain. The question is, what's driving those disparities and what can be done? This slide shows the results of a meta-analysis conducted by Greg Millett and colleagues to explain HIV-related disparities among MSM in the United States. And even though you can't see them, the results show that disparities are driven by social determinants and structural factors rather than by individual risk behaviors. Previously, we have devoted many of our prevention efforts on reducing individual risk behavior, which will do little to reduce disparities because that's not where the differences lie. Another way to view the influence of social determinants is by examining the HIV continuum of care. Here we see that disparities persist between black and other MSM throughout the treatment cascade. And here we see differences in income, health insurance coverage, and health care visits. Just last month, the New York Times Magazine featured a story highlighting the huge disparities in HIV among black, gay, and bisexual men in the United States, primarily in the South. The article highlighted the huge disparities in access to both PrEP and basic sexual health services, particularly in the rural South, as well the need for ongoing support to maintain adherence to ART and to PrEP. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about a couple of US-based examples of how we might begin to intervene upon social determinants and health systems. The first is a demonstration project, Care and Prevention in the United States, or CAPAS, which funded health departments in states with high rates of HIV among African Americans and Latinos. Activities were focused on structural and policy change related to testing, navigation and linkage, retention and re-engagement. And a couple of specific examples to show how they attempted to address stigma and social determinants included in Louisiana, they conducted workshops with state health department and CBO employees to address institutional racism and trans and homophobia. Virginia conducted a housing and employment pilot for people with, living with HIV who were recently released from jail. And several sites provided transportation assistance in areas with limited options to help increase access to care. CDC's CARS, or the Community Approaches to Reducing Sexually Transmitted Diseases, use community engagement methods and partnerships to build local STI prevention and control capacity. They identified social determinants of health and implemented innovative interventions to reduce STIs and improve health equity. The social determinants of health targeted by CARS included fear and stigma for testing and treatment, lack of provider support and youth friendliness, lack of sexual health information and education, and limited access to sexual health services. CAR sites engaged in a number of relevant program activities. They hosted youth sexual health town hall meetings and community events to disseminate sexual health information and address fear and stigma. They conducted provider cultural competence and humility training. They connected youth to youth and YMSM friendly providers. They linked youth with programs and resources that address transportation and medical service barriers and they worked with partners to conduct STI screenings in community settings. These studies are a step in the right direction, although we don't have outcome data to indicate whether these efforts had an impact on disparities, which seems like a nice next step. So in conclusion, STI prevention programs should engage communities with ongoing, genuine, and mutual advice and feedback. 
STI activities should be incorporated into community level intervention projects. To chip away at negative social determinants of health requires long-term planning, acceptance of innovation, and is not made easier by declining resources for important traditional STI prevention and control activities. However, until disparities and underlying social determinants are addressed, we will not see reduction in STI disparities. This advice from Hogman and Licklider is almost 10 years old. It's time to act. Thank you to my wonderful colleagues for their assistance with this presentation. Thank you very much for your time. So let's move and call our second speaker in this plenary. Uh, it's my honor to call Deborah Denise. She's an anthropologist by training and she is professor of law in the University of Brasilia and also at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. And Deborah, since last year, she's involving in research, communication, advocacy, and community-based leadership um, um, regarding Zika virus. So she's gonna talk about, um, hmm. Um, lesson learned from the Zika epidemic, reproductive, reproductive justice as a human rights. Deborah, please. And thank the discussion you so will be in the end of the section. Yes. So thank you so much for the invitation for being here. And I'm sorry for my Brazilian colleagues who are speaking in English, but it's only a way to welcome our foreigners in this country. So it's a great pleasure to participate in such an important conference for HIV STI community. I've just realized how the title of my conversation might sound a bit exaggerated, lessons learned from the Zika epidemic. But it, as you know, this city, this country is the epicenter of the Zika epidemic in the globe. And I'm not talking about Zika fever, the ordinary disease from tropi tropical countries with symptoms of fever or hash. I'm talking about the risk of sexual transmission, of vertical transmission from women to babies. Brazil has more than Oh, sorry. Oh, here. Yeah. More than 13,000 cases of children with the primary diagnosis of microcephaly and around 3,000 cases confirmed for the Zika congenital syndrome. As far as you know, Zika arrived in Brazil in 2014 and the story goes that it arrived with the World Cup. So Brazilian people usually say that we lost the World Cup and won Zika. So the mosquito vector has been a member of the Brazilian family for more than four decades. It lives inside a family and enjoys being in the bedroom. So we usually we say that it's a family pet. So we already knew that the mosquito transmits dengue and chikungunya when Zika arrived. So at first it was just one more disease from the same vector. The challenge was accepting that such an ordinary mosquito, uh, a family, that family, described, explained me, such a teeny animal. So. So how could it be the cause of such a tremendous impact on fetus? So equally challenging was accepting that both mosquito and sexual transmission are forms of transmission. So families use everyday observation in facing science. So women tell me in my family, I was the only one to get Zika. 
my husband didn't have it. How can it be sexually transmitted? Of course, we can try to explain to them that the same people with Zika do not have symptoms, but again, it's challenging to explain that a mild disease can cause such a tremendous and lasting impact on babies. An easy way to talk about Zika and HIV in my presentation would be, it is a disease with a risk of sexual transmission. We could discuss a long list of common issues between Zika and HIV. Sexual education in schools, gender norms, contraceptive methods, abortion, vertical transmission, and children's care. It would provide me a shortcut to our conversation, but it would not necessarily allow us to fully consider lessons learned from Zika epidemic, and specifically the idea of reproductive justice as an ethical frame. So what I do understand as reproductive justice it is a fact that only in epidemiological textbooks, Zika is a disease with equal risk to all people exposed to the mosquito. In terms of reality, there is a concentration of Zika among poor, rural, low-educated, black, brown, and indigenous women in northeast Brazil. And why? Because Zika is a disease that mirrors Brazilian inequality. The mosquito is everywhere, but some women have access to mosquito repellent, to long-lasting family planning methods, to abortion, even being illegal in this country, or access to information to plan a family life without having children for a while. So it would be naive that the reasons for these inequalities are exclusively ecological, such as poor public sanitation or previous illness, such as dengue. Most of the reasons for the concentration among vulnerable women are social reasons. Zika pulled back the curtain of, on many small and permanent injustices of everyday life of this country. And this is reproductive justice. An ethical principle to seriously consider inequalities in our policies. To Zika, reproductive justice is a powerful lens to analyze the effects of the epidemic in Brazilian society. On one hand, it is true that all women at reproductive age may be at risk and fear of the Zika epidemic. On the other hand, some of us are in a more dramatic state of vulnerability. For all of us, a strong social welfare state is central in an epidemic situation. For some women, they must demand access to welfare state via litigation, otherwise they will be forgotten and abandoned. So I'm going to share two experiences of facing the epidemic's consequences that have been inspired by the reproductive justice lens. I should remind you that the emergency situation is still in force in this country. In May, two months ago, the Minister of Health announced the lift of the emergency situation. But in fact, it was not a concrete decision, so it's only an announcement. So the emergency situation of Zika is still in force in Brazil. So my first experience that I would like to share with you is what I call faces and numbers. An epidemic is of, often only discussed in numbers, statistics, and risks. During the first months of the epidemic in Brazil, there were no individuals, only numbers and alerts. Microcephaly was a new word for the lay public, and it quickly became a threatening one. The stories of actual individuals bore strange titles. The Brazilian zero patient, or were limited, limited to strange images like that one, such an image of a baby's brain affected by Zika. Media people were in charge of shifting the biomedical frames from surveillance to biographies, 
from numbers to faces. But media has its own moral frames. So let me tell you about the group I've been working with. We are an interdisciplinary group of people doing biomedical and social sciences and litigation. We took on the task of trying to understand and create awareness about the effects of the epidemic in a broad perspective, combining both numbers and stories of people surviving the epidemic. Our very first task was to produce a documentary film. We feel want, in anthropological terms, an ethnographic film. We went to the epicenter of the epidemic, a small city in Paraíba, and we told the stories of five women whose lives were affected by Zika. Among them was the very first woman to donate amniotic fluid from which Zika virus was identified. The film was an important step to providing faces and voices to the numbers. The film was shown to other affected women around the country, but also to lab scientists who only knew about Zika via blood samples in the film. They were able to see beyond the samples. For the very first time, they heard the story of the woman who lost her baby because of Zika and who had donated the amniotic fluid. The women were the face of Brazilian inequality and their demands were connected to our understanding of reproductive justice. Instead of just in writing an academic paper describing their profiles and needs, we show them. We show them telling their stories in their own words. The reproductive justice frame is embedded in all of their stories. A film is not a mirror of the reality, but a, a narrative about the reality. Our narrative is about the rights violated by the epidemic. That woman, she travels more than five hours a day for half an hour of early stimulation for her baby. These women don't have access to information and they are lacking basic social needs, social assistance. So faces and numbers together articulate different types of knowledge and sensibilities. The numbers of Zika were growing daily, but we still were not hearing women's voices. We knew little about their survival and the kind of support offered by the government. We knew there was much more to understand than the public policies and official discourse particularly in a country facing a presidential impeachment. Our second step was the Alagoas expedition. Alagoas is the Brazilian state with the lowest human development index and the highest rate of adolescent pregnancy. In December of 2016, we had a list of the municipalities that had reported cases of Zika syndrome to the national surveillance. The official numbers showed 86 women in 44 municipalities in Alagoas. I visit 54 women in 21 cities. I'm not going to share with you the results of the expedition. I can, I can share with you the link of, to the report. But I have to tell you some findings that shocked me. Three in every four women were adolescents. Half of them was not using any contraceptive method or not planning a new baby. None of them went back to paid work or to school. Number, numbers, faces, and voices can have a transformative role in incorporating reproductive justice in our efforts to face the epidemic. The numbers may offer a sense of relief that is just other people, distant from us, but the faces have the power to disturb us. Patricia, 
is the family of the pa patient zero in Alagoas. But I can describe her as the mother of Gabriel. We can also look at her and her family from a different perspective. The six kids, the poverty, the state's abandonment of his family. I ask you to hear the words, patient zero, and then look to Patricia and Gabriel. Same story, but different reactions, different feelings. My second experience, and I'm going to, to finish, is related to research and advocacy. It's not enough to demonstrate that an epidemic violates rights. We need to protect them, or at least to find ways to guarantee the rights. The third wave of children affected by Zika is now coming. She's Tainara, 16 years old. She's pregnant right now, and she got Zika at, this, at the first trimester of the pregnancy. She didn't know about sexual transmission of Zika. If you aggregate stories to numbers, if you create numbers with stories, we have the potential to transform the stories and numbers into judicial cases to guarantee reproductive justice. In August of last year, 2016, we filled a case with the Brazilian Supreme Court to protect a group of rights violated by the epidemic. When we think about reproductive justice, we have to open our eyes to all the facts of the epidemic, including the needs of daily life. It's true that children need medicines, but they also need transportation and access to sexual education in schools. The case is about all of these daily life demands, from education and health, to transportation and so social assistance. The experience I would like to share is that an epidemic like Zika demands more than us as researchers. We have to also advocate for rights. I do not believe there should be a division between those who are scientists and those who use science to guarantee rights. An epidemic forces us to blur the borders between these roles. The scientists have the, to be the spokespersons of reproductive justice in the courts, in the communities, at the hospitals, at the policy level. I know how you are so committed to rights. So I'm not sharing with you lessons, but telling you stories of how we can combine biomedical and social sciences so that all of us, lab people, and like me, storytellers can use our knowledge, time, and authority to guarantee rights violated by an epidemic. Thank you. OK, so thank you so much to both of the speakers. Um, they were really um, interesting reflections on the interface between the social and biomedical and the lessons that we learn um, as the landscape evolves, um, either with new um, devastating epidemics or with new interventions. So I'd like to ask, um, open the floor for discussion. Um, could, could people ask you questions? Please come to the microphones um, that are along here. Okay, and we'll start right here. Thanks. Thank you. Gracias, Deborah. Uh, very nice to hear you again. Uh, we have you several times in DC and admire and respect your work. Could you please elaborate a little bit on the um, legislation that you have been trying to improve? Te lo en español. Portugués no hablo. I'm sorry for asking her to repeat. So what is the legislation? Basically, abortion is against the law in Brazil. So if a woman performs an abortion, she goes to jail. But one in five of Brazilian women at the age of 40 had at least one abortion. 
and we have some epidemiological information that we had a decrease on the rate of birth. Some people consider that is caused by the Zika epidemic. So one of the demands is to have the right to have a, what we say a legal abortion if a woman is in a mental suffering caused by the epidemic. The second demand is to have free and universal transportation to bring the, the kids to early stimulation. The third demand is to have access to universal uh, cash benefit transfer to families affected by Zika. It's a minimum wage, so it's $200 a month, so it's not that amount of money. And to include mosquito repellent as a prenatal care. It's a basic measure to prevent Zika um, among women, pregnant women. And the last demand is related to include long-lasting methods at the SUS, the Universal Health System. So, as you can see, very basic demands related how to protect women and children during the epidemic. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, I would like to thank you for your presentations. And Deborah was really emotional, your presentation. It's like... I'm amazed. I want to watch the, the, the film. Um, but my question goes to Patricia. Uh, I'd like to ask you, considering the new focus for social and behavioral research, um, how are the, the perspectives for research about lesbian and bisexual women and women who have sex with women? Because I even dare to say during this conference, this Congress, there was almost like none uh, space with this question, like, how are the sexual health of women who have sex with another woman? Thank you. That's a really great question, thank you. Um, I, and I agree that a lot of our focus tends to lean towards men who have sex with men and HIV risk. Um, within CDC and within Division of STD Prevention and within Division of Adolescent and School Health, in fact, uh, there's a much broader focus on research and program for a wider range of sexual and gender minority youth. And I haven't seen much at the conference to date covering those populations either, and I think they're incredibly important and more and more work really does need to be done. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm, hi, thank you for both inspiring presentations. Uh, I would like to ask your opinion, Deborah, or what are the perspectives for this third, woman, third wave of women affected by Zika since it's like, it's a different context. I, I feel like during the Olympic Games, for instance, there was more, more visibility on this thing because it would be like an international nomination and so on. And also in a context when our public health system is even more underfunded, and what's our capacity to, to tackle this question now? Thank you. I, uh, okay. Thank you for your question, and I have to tell you that I'm a typical Brazilian speaking, so she said that I was really effective speaking, but it's my way, so really sorry for being so exaggerated like that. So, yes, we, we had a decrease on the numbers on Zika. So this is a fact that the third wave of women is not the same as we had the first wave. But the problem is that I'm flying from here to Alagoas, and I'm going to meet 12 women affected by Zika and pregnant. So Zika is still here, and we decided not to talk about Zika anymore. And so Zika didn't leave Brazil. And we have a political situation that talking about Zika, I'm sorry because I'm with the head of the Department of Minister of Health here. No, but I'm not Zika. no, no, I know, I know. No, she's not the Zika person, so I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to be rude. It's only to say that the political situation to talk about Zika, it's not safe. But it, again, why we decided to avoid discussing, to discuss Zika? It's because we're talking about the Brazilian inequality. We're talking about Northeast women that for the long history, they, they, they are not the faces of the... What, go, go ahead, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> well, Zika probably is sexual transmitted. 
and is going to be in our department, but not yet. Um, so um, just to say to you that I um, um, support you in all your thought about the support that we have and should do to do justice with the one that are affected with Zika. This is a, a very good fight and I really congratulate you because it's not only putting down the numbers of infection, it's what the infection last year and this year did to families. So I really support you on our, your request as you explicited here and is, is very, I'm very proud of you to say so in an in a international plenary. But still, the epidemiology is saying that it's going down. What our department made is to make a really, um, with WHO, we are looking uh, in a big project with Welcome Trust to look at the sexual transmission of the Zika virus in the country. But this is to have evidence in our country that he really is a sexual transmission. But uh, I really agree with you with everything you did. So Jackie Jennings from Johns Hopkins, thank you both for the wonderful, sharing your wonderful talks. Patty, I wanted to ask you um, a question and, and thank you for the complexity that you were able to convey um, in such a short time uh, about how much we have learned but how much you know, room we still have to go. So I have sort of a two-part question for you. Um, the first is, you know, in all of that complexity, then, it, you know, are we, are individual level interventions sort of no longer useful or needed? Um, and then, do you know of examples where, in fact, uh, these, this very complexity is being brought to bear in a biomedical uh, intervention? You know, a good example of how that's, that's being brought to bear, the, all of this complexity, but yet uh, in a targeted intervention. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so, first part, no, I don't think that it's the end of the utility or need for individual level behavioral interventions, but I, I think it's clear that they're not enough, right? And so I was really encouraged and excited in yesterday's symposium when Brian Mostansky and Patrick Sullivan talked about the exact combination of these two approaches. So they're looking at behavioral theory-based interventions along with online solutions for increasing access and reach of biomedical interventions. And even more exciting, as a psychologist, they're going to be pitting together against one another different behavioral theory approaches, which is really cool. And I mean, when I come up with the lack of access to prep, for example, in rural areas, I think their online approach is exactly the way that we need to go. So I think we're headed into a really exciting direction for both behavioral and biomedical research. Great, thank you. So thank you. Are there any other questions? Adele? Okay, well, we've come to the end. Thanks, everyone, very much. A big thank you to our speakers um, for great talks, and um, thanks to everyone for joining.